Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We'll get started in a minute uh, while we wait for others to join. All right. Thank you, everyone, again, for joining us today. I'm Kevin Kazmaier, Vice President of Channel Development here at Trade Centric, and I'm joined today by Isaiah Bollinger, CEO at Trellis. Uh, welcome, Isaiah. Yeah, thanks for thanks for inviting me and having me. Yeah, well, we're excited to be here today to discuss the disconnect in B2B commerce and how connected commerce helps fill that gap. Uh, but before we get started, let me review a few housekeeping items for today. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll reach out with answers via LinkedIn, or you can email us directly at info at tradecentric.com. Also, you can connect with either Isaiah or myself if you have any follow-up questions or thoughts about the session. And so now uh, let me hand it over to Isaiah to tell us a little bit about yourself and really get us kicked off with this session. Yeah, uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. I, uh, I started Trellis in 2012. Uh, really kind of all over all over the place. Didn't really know what I was doing. I was pretty young, uh, but kind of fell into B2B e-commerce pretty early on. Um, kind of fell in love with e-commerce and just felt like it was underserved, especially with small business. You know, you know, we're talking 12 years ago. Um, these were kind of the early days of Magento, um, Shopify, like kind of really, you know, and big commerce hadn't really taken off yet. Um, and then we kind of quickly realized that B2B was even more untapped and we just kind of started to get more knowledgeable about it. And <clears throat> over time, you know, it became a big part of what we do. And uh, we learned about things like at the time it was punch outs ago and now you guys are, are, are tra trade centric. So. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And that's an interesting journey. B2B is definitely a, a complicated space and, you know, yeah. so complicated, right. That, you know, there's, there's this disconnect that, seems to happen a lot between buyers and suppliers. And, and, and we see that every day that, you know, sometimes these, these B2B buyers, they, they just don't understand what their suppliers are or, or, under, or understand what they're doing or, or how they support them. And so I'm wondering, like, what's your thoughts around those, those disconnects between buyers and suppliers? Yeah, the, um, I, I don't know if you know but, uh, how, much, or how much you've seen our podcast. So I run the hard truth about B2B e-commerce. Not, not necessarily just trying to plug my podcast, but it does have as you guys on it. And um, this is a lot of what we talk about is just like, why are B2B companies not more serious about e-commerce, right? And digitizing, automating things. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but obviously, as you can see here, um, you know, only about 35% or let's say one third are investing in e-commerce and the automation relative to the estimated um, customer demand, which is about two thirds, right? And I think you're going to see that demand go higher, right? It's maybe 61% now. It's probably going to be 70, 75 as, you know, millennials start to take over more of the buying process. So if anything, that's only going to go up and, you know, not investing in it, I think is a mistake. I, I think we, we've talked a lot about this on the podcast. I don't think anyone has like a perfect answer. I think it's partly a cultural thing. Some of it is just, hey, if it's if it's, you know, if it works, uh, you know, it's not broken. Don't don't try and fix it. Um, I think there's a fear of the unknown. Um, there's just there's just so many different reasons to stop someone from from doing it. And I think also it's hard for them to wrap their head around the ROI and the life cycle of the investment because it's not as simple as maybe their previous investments. And so um, sometimes it's just easier to do nothing. So we see a lot of do nothing or maybe make under investment in which they're, they're not really making the proper investment. And it's also, I think it's hard to find experts like you and companies like trade centric or trellis. There's not as many, there's a lot of e-commerce companies, but not that many that really understand B2B e-commerce, you know? 
So. Yeah, yeah, true, right? I mean, and and to basically be able to show you where those ROI opportunities are. But I think exactly. when you look at it, like the, the market is so huge and maybe it's just that, that that people don't understand the true opportunity that's out there. You know, they may say, yeah. I don't see that that in my customer base or I don't focus on an industry that may have e-procurement. But in fact, it's a pretty big opportunity. I mean, I, I get emails more and more that our customers, you know, we don't have that many enterprise customers, but more and more I get Coupa emails. Like I'm in all kind of like our billing and, you know, we're not a huge company. So I see like. I'm in the billing, you know, channels, you know, and it's just, yeah, e-procurement's becoming a bigger thing. Also, just people want to be able to go on and, and buy online, right? And so um, I think that there's an underestimation of how much business is being lost to Amazon business or even like a Home Depot. You know, my wife runs, I like to tell the story because it's very personal. My wife runs a small Airbnb business. So we have three, three properties and, you know, it's not some huge enterprise. But she's mostly buying online, buy online, pick up and store from, you know, Home Depot, Amazon business and these. But she is a business, right? It's a small business, but she's not calling up and trying to get quotes all the time. Like she wants to just get things fast, you know? Um, exactly. I mean, they, they the people want to get in and get out. They want to be serviced quickly. And uh, and I don't think that the, the, the B2B buyers or suppliers understand that, that true scope, right? I mean, that market yeah. is huge. Exactly. I think it's also like a gray area where like the, the market's so big and complex. I don't, like I said, I think that some of it gets spilled into B2C, but really they're B2B orders, right? Because it's maybe someone buying on, you know, some of these other marketplaces, but really they're a business. Yeah, definitely. So if you think about it, right, there's a huge opportunity. With with the amount of, of transactions, I mean, one trillion is is unbelievable when you think about yeah. the B two B space of how much is getting transacted. Yeah, and that's just the trillion going through procurement connections. I mean, there's also the other trillions outside of it, right? And so that's going to keep growing. E procurement's going to keep growing, and that's why I think it's just it's building into these different systems, right? You have e procurement, you have obviously many different ERP systems that maybe you have plus maybe your clients have or your suppliers have. Um, so I think just digitization of B2B transactions in some manner is going to be more and more important. And e-procurement is a great place to start because that's what they're designed for, right? I mean, the Koopas of the world um, are taking a bigger, you know, um, market share. Uh, and, and I think pretty much every, what is it? Every company that's going public has to have some sort of e-procurement solution, I believe. So we've noticed that companies that are kind of gearing up for the next stage of investment, they're often buying a Coupa or, or something like that, or, or investing in a procurement specialist employee that, that they maybe didn't have in the past. Um, so yeah, I think you're going to see that steady 20% growth. Um, even more, I mean, B2C e-commerce has actually slowed down. I think if you notice, you, you'll look at the re reports, it's down to maybe 10% or less growth per year. I think B2B e-procurement and e-commerce, like both, just digitization of B2B e-commerce is more like 20% growth moving forward. I think it's actually going to outpace B2C in the coming years because people know what they want in B2B. So if you can digitize it, it makes a lot more sense. Whereas in B2C, people still do want to go to stores and physically touch things and they're exploring things. You're not really doing that as much in B2B, right? You kind of usually are, you know, buying a solution that you know you need, you know? Yeah. Yeah, correct. I mean, and you think about that, though, but, you know, when you put that B2C experience online, right, and start looking at it from that perspective, anybody that's in a business today is so used to buying online in the, in the B2C world yeah. that they want that same experience in B2B and they want to be able to, to, to do something automated. So you think about that and, and the suppliers that are not integrating today, like, What's the challenge? Why won't why why can't, why don't they understand that this is what their buyers are looking for? Yeah, I, I think there's just no more excuses anymore. Like the technology's there, right? There's platforms like Trade Centric. There's e-commerce platforms like Adobe Commerce, Magento, Big Commerce. I think I think Big Commerce has made some amazing strides, making it more affordable. You know, as kind of like a easier SaaS platform. Shopify is investing a lot in B two B. So I think that like you know, Coupa, but all these, this, the platforms are there and they're not, 
that expensive anymore. And, and there's just really no excuse. And if you're you know going to this slide, if you're manually processing orders, especially processing orders where they're repeat buyers, or I think there's a, there's a, a argument to be made that, okay, the first time you're onboarding a customer, there's more manual processes involved, right? It kind of makes sense that, but I think especially once they've already bought from you and they're coming back, it really makes no sense not to automate this, you know, 20, 25 minutes. And I'm sure there's cases where it could be much more than that. Um, if you factor in maybe some other aspects of what goes into an order to, to integrate all of this. I mean, I just think the simplest thing is like, as a buyer, I hate having to re input any sort of credentials or payments when I know the technology is there where I could, should be able to go online, log into my account. And I think there's no more excuse anymore. It used to be, oh, well, I don't want to do credit card. I want to do purchase order. You can still have ACH saved. I mean, these modern tech platforms have figured it out. You, you know, most, most, you know, major SaaS players, uh, you know, or things that are involved like that will allow you to do a saved ACH transfer. You know, for instance, like a Robinhood is a, just a basic example, right? If you want to add money to Robinhood, it has your ACH saved. You don't have to re-input your ACH every time. So once you're set up, literally click a button, pay is, is possible, right? So I think the whole like, oh, we want to take credit card, that is an excuse I think a lot of B2B companies make because they're like, oh, if we make it online, then everyone will use credit card and then we'll have to pay 3% fees. But you can definitely create ACH payments online. Um, I just don't think that's an excuse anymore to digitize that. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and, and, and when you think about it, like if you put it in perspective, right, that whole buying experience, what these buyers want, from a supplier's perspective, if you're not integrated, you're disconnected from your buyers, right? They can't gotcha. see you. They don't understand your offering. They they then send you a purchase order and it's going to come via email or some portal. And now yeah. you have to follow the same steps to do invoice integration. So this whole manual processing time can just be a huge burden on supplier organizations. There's also a lot of opportunity for error, right? Or missing things. Whereas if you set up integrations uh, with all the modern integration technology, you can set up error reporting. So if there is an error through the integrations, it's not to say that integrations are always perfect, right? There are issues that come up, but you can have error reporting so you can get alerted. You can see that there is an error and go and correct it immediately. Whereas the manual processes, you won't know that the error happened until it's too late. You'll ship the wrong item. You'll forget to collect payment, you know, and I'm sure this happens more than most companies uh, care to admit, you know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, right. And then you think about it, right. So now it having that full on connected commerce solution, right, really allows you to take advantage yeah. of all the opportunities to automate that that procure to pay cycle. So like you're saying, being able to see and, and actively respond to errors or failures or challenges and going into a, a, a platform to kind of correct them in real time so that you're not correcting it a week later when the when your customer says, oh, yeah, yeah. I have an error with my order. So like there's some huge advantages to kind of connecting the entire order purchase to pay ecosystem to your platform. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah. And I think that this is where people kind of get overwhelmed, right, is there's all these different potential integrations. And they're not aware there are platforms like trade centric and and just technology in the space that makes this much easier to do um you know they, they maybe i think people see integration they get scared or they have like previous bad experiences maybe doing like custom erp integrations you know how that stuff used to get really complicated back and i think that's part of it is that um they they haven't modernized their technology so today you can buy these SaaS platforms that are much more modern, like a NetSuite, um, obviously, like I said, trade centric, big commerce. You could you could really move to more like SaaS based cloud operation that has modern APIs across the full stack. And I think just a lot of companies are maybe resistant to that change or they don't want to go through the pain of going to that change. But I think once you get there, you know, you have this this fully connected potential that's just so much more um, modern and easy to operate once you get there. Yeah. I mean, that's so true. And from like, from our mm -hmm. side, what we see is when you start to connect to your customers, it comes with additional benefits from, yeah. from an ROI perspective, right? So like three main benefits that I like to kind of 
to let our customers know is that not only are they going to see an increase in revenue from your existing customers, but you're going to be able to attract new customers as well. Right. Yeah. And, and then you have the ability to optimize the order to cash process and shorten time to get paid. Right. So now you're improving DSO, you're getting cash faster. You have more happy customers because they're not going yeah. on credit gold. Well, right? I can tell you this is happening. So if you're not working on this, you know, private equity is coming in, buying these B2B companies, building these automations, modernizing these companies, as well as the big enterprise companies have obviously already started to make these investments for years or even decades in some cases. And I think these are just the most immediate like ROI you can gain. And then on top of that, if you build this true connected commerce platform and maybe have like a good e-commerce experience that ties back to your customers, so there's not double entry, um, you can get them merchandising and shopping on, on your website and you have the ability to upsell, cross sell, you know, better um, recommendations and you can leverage all kind of like the marketing automation that you wouldn't get if you just kind of went with manual processes, right? And so there's a whole like merchandising ability, I think too, if you can get people to start using the e-commerce side of things as well. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, if, if you think about this kind of to recap it all, right? It's really like connected commerce is solving a lot of your B2B challenges. And I was wondering if you could like close us out with, with some thoughts on that. Like, how would you recap what we just discussed? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there's a few different things, right? I think automating, like you said, that that cash, you know, process um, so that, you know, you're not spending so much manual label, labor processing orders. Um, I think one, it's it, those smaller orders are probably not very profitable um, if you manually do them. So I think connected commerce is going to make your your ability to handle the long tail much more profitable and maybe onboard some smaller customers or even large customers that want to make a small order to test you out. So you're going to be, I think, more profitable on those, you know, kind of long tail orders and, and reach a wider audience. And then with your bigger customers, I think you just become much more embedded and, and relevant to them because you're connected into their systems and um, you become uh, kind of like almost like more of a partner than you do just another vendor, right? The, the deeper you're integrated into your, into your customers and your suppliers. Yeah. So really integration, connection equals success. And, you know, with that, uh, I appreciate you joining me today, Isaiah. We're out of time in our session. Um, but, you know, thank you so much for joining to discuss this really important topic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for Thanks for having me. Yeah. And just as a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions, please connect with either Isaiah or myself on LinkedIn. Send us uh, your questions to the email address on screen. And once again, thank you, everyone, for joining today.